Hello everyone, my name is Manisa Shrestha and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Astrophysics Research Institute in Liverpool, UK. I have a poster talking about a polarimetric technique uh, used to constrain the magnetic field structure and strength of gamma reverse jets. Uh, here I, in the poster, I talk about how dedicated telescope like uh, Liverpool telescope, which is a two meter class telescope uh, designed for rapid follow up of uh, different time domain sciences and here focusing on GRB has been very successfully uh, observing early afterglow with polarimeter and here is a sketch of Ringo 3, the polarimeter we use. And um, I talk about one of the very interesting results we got here recently, which is for GRB 191060E, where with the addition of combination of light curve and polarimetric uh, data, we were able to show that uh, this GRV has a long-lived central engine with energy injection pretty late in time. And also we have been looking into how polarization is affected by different properties of gamma ray burst jets. Here is an example of photometric power law decay index, but we have been looking at other properties as well. And uh, if you are interested about how polarimetry can be complementary to your research when we are looking at transients like GRB, please come by the poster and I will be very happy to talk about it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Yael Hillman from the Ariel University in Israel. My poster presents some aspects that show the importance of multiband observations of novae. A novae eruption is a sudden brightening that reaches 10,000 times solar brightness. It very often seems to appear just out of nowhere, and that's because before erupting, there's a very long accretion phase during which the white dwarf slowly and quiescently just pulls mass away from its companion, which is a red less evolved star. So hydrogen and rich matter piles up onto the surface of this degenerate white dwarf, causing the subsurface pressure and temperature to increase until hydrogen burning starts. Now, since this burning happens under degenerate conditions, the white dwarf doesn't react by expanding, and this results in further heating, and it triggers a thermonuclear runaway, causing a violent ejection of mass. Eventually, the ejection stops, and the white dwarf slowly returns to its pre-eruption state. At this point, accretion can start again. So basically, a cycle is complete. Here's an example in visual. There's an eruption, a before picture, and a much after picture. So there's three phases, accretion, eruption, and decline. And they have very different effective temperatures and time scales. This means that different bands would be suitable for observing at different epochs. Visual during the eruption, UV to soft X-ray after the eruption, and then during the long accretion phase, the cold red donor and the accretion disk may be detectable in the IR. Now, if we use a different accretion rate or a different white dwarf mass, the time scales change. This implies that long epochs of simultaneous multiband observations could help build a time dependent temperature curve for any system that produces novae. And combining the data with models of temperature curves could help identify basic parameters that define the system the white dwarf mass, the accretion rate, and the time between eruptions. There's more details in my poster, and feel free to contact me. I'm Ashley Frank. I'm a sixth year graduate student at Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'm discussing constraining the size of the torus of NGC 6418. In this poster, I present mid infrared dust reverberation mapping results for the AGN NGC 6418. Our infrared data is from Spitzer during cycles eight and nine and the optical data is combined from several ground-based telescopes. In the light curves, you can see a large optical flare occurs at the beginning of Spitzer cycle nine, and the infrared clearly responds to it. NGC 6418 is also a changing look AGN when you compare um, one spectrum taken before that large optical flare and another taken after we see that the, this AGN appears to change from a Seifert 1.9 to a Seifert 1 AGN. 
I also performed cross correlation analysis separately um, for each cycle, cycle eight and cycle nine. And I found that the lag increases from cycle eight to cycle nine for both Spitzer channels. And this is because the optical flare destroys the dust grains in the inner regions of the torus due to sublimation. And that causes an increase in the inner radius of the torus and thus an increase in the lag I measure. Um, also through looking at features in the light curve and features in the spectra, we can see that NGC 6418 has undergone a changing look event, both due to a change in extinction and a change in the intrinsic luminosity of the AGN. So if this sounds interesting to you, please take a look at my poster later. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michał Michałowski from Poznań, Poland. And I would like to talk about what we can learn about transients from 21 uh, H1 line emission in their environments. So first, when we look at uh, the host galaxies of gamma ray bursts or broad line supernovae type 1c, we always see strong concentration of H1 close to the event position. So that suggests that the birth of their progenitor is connected with the inflow of gas from the intergalactic medium. Similar story is for fast radio bursts. Here we either see a very asymmetric H1 line profiles, or in one case, we even see the H1 companions. So the birth of FRB progenitors is somehow connected with galaxy interaction. So in both cases of GRB, supernovae, and uh, FRBs, uh, the conclusion is that these data uh, supports fast uh, channel of, the, of their progenitors. It's slightly different for fast uh, blue optical transients, although there is only one case analyzed here in H1, 18 cow, and in that case, uh, the H1 distribution is more regular, is more symmetric, so if that turns out to be the case for a larger sample, then that would suggest that the progenitors of uh, F-bots are different than progenitors of GRBs, supernovae, and FRBs. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dennis Leahy. Uh, my poster is on far ultraviolet variable stars in M31, work done at the uh, University of Calgary. This is based on observations with the AstroSat satellite. To illustrate uh, the data here, I've shown the uh, Galax image of a small region and one of our exposures with UVIT, uh, showing that we could resolve many of the stars in M31. The observations were done in five far ultraviolet and near ultraviolet filters, bulge field and the uh, field northeast of the bulge. We have multi-epoch observations for the bulge field. The two epochs are separated about three years for the northeast field. The uh, two epochs are separated by about four and a half years. With the point source catalogs for both epochs, we can identify variables at three sigma level and five sigma level. Here we plot the uh, variables on an NUV FUV color magnitude diagram along with isoc stellar isochrones. So we can see most of them are consistent with young stars between 30 and 30 million years old. We next identified these stars using uh, various catalogs, including Gaia. We know the uh, counterparts of 60 of these. The last bit of the analysis was a spatial analysis. We could show that in both the bulge field and the northeast field, there are fractionally more variables compared to non-variables in the spiral arms than in the interarm regions. I'll be talking to you about my poster, which is about the Transient UV Objects Project. Um, so as we know, there are transient searching facilities operating really across the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, but there's a bit of a gap in the UV, so we have no systematic large-scale uh, transient searches occurring at the UV wavelength. 
This is kind of a shame because it turns out that the UV data is actually really important, especially at early times, um, to understand the physical mechanisms causing loss of these transient phenomena from supernovae, tidal disruption events, and dwarf novae. Uh, but additionally, because we haven't looked for transients in the UV really, um, we could discover completely new kinds of sources. We don't really know what's out there. So the idea of the TUO project is to use currently operational UV facilities to look for transients in near real time in the UV. And so what we need is a UV telescope with real time data that we can access. And for that, we use a UVOT aboard SWIFT. And then we need a, a method for processing their images to look for transients. And for that, we use TUO pipe, which is the customized pipeline that we built for this purpose. So we run the pipeline every day. Uh, it downloads uh, and, and analyzes um, SWIFT images using difference imaging. So it uses two images of the same field creates a difference image and then transients pop up in the difference image and then it creates light curves for all our candidates. So we're running this program for over a year and we've processed over 100,000 UVOT images, but our idea is not to make any statistical inference about UV transients, but just to identify the really interesting ones and follow them up. So for that, we have um, ground-based spectroscopy and photometry programs uh, we run, which we use to follow up, characterize and classify the uh, interesting candidates. So I'll just leave you with an example study. Um, last February, we discovered uh, some bright UV outbursts from an unclassified source. Uh, we thought it was a dwarf nova, so an, an outburst from an accreting white dwarf. Um, and then we obtained an optical spectrum to confirm this classification with salt. And we talk about how important the UV observations are for the accretion processes in cataclysmic variables. Thank you.